Welcome to another episode of Eberhard Outdoors. Um, this particular uh, series that I'm going to be doing here, I'm going to probably do one of these every two, three weeks, is going to be about kills in my past where um, I've always written articles or just information down about kills, just data, uh, type of tree, situation, date, time. Uh, back in the old days, I did wind direction. I don't do that anymore because I don't care unless I'm hunting in a scrape area. Uh, but there's just a lot of detailed information in my articles that I think you can, a lot of people can take stuff away and put it in their, their hunting, hunting plans. Or maybe I did something stupid and I write about it and it's something you may not want to do either <laughs> going forward. So I'll, I'll save you that step. And this particular article is going to be about a buck I shot in uh, 2006. Other than that, uh, I'd like you to reply in whether it be positive or negative on what you think about me reading articles. It's something you can listen to when you're driving or working or whatever you do. Um, that way you don't have to read it because, uh, <coughs> <coughs> Like a lot of hunters, I'm, I'm, I don't like to read a lot either. I'd rather listen to something or visually see it, uh, get more out of it that way, I think. But uh, anyway, I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoy this and uh, please shoot out a reply. Thank you. In my opinion, if you don't vote, you should never complain about what the government is doing. The midterm election in 2006 was held on November 7th. And my plan for that day was to hunt near my home in northern Michigan until about 9 a.m., uh, go vote at the local township hall, and then drive about two hours and 40 minutes to southern Michigan to hunt a different location during the midday slash evening shift. Uh, my Michigan season had not been going very well at this point because uh, during the first five weeks of season, I'd seen one buck that I thought Thought was a mature buck, three and a half years old, and he wouldn't even have scored 95 inches. But there's one thing about deer hunting, things can change at a moment's notice. The odds of taking a larger antler buck in southern Michigan are much greater than where I reside in northern Michigan. The soil up north where I'm at is very sandy, it has a lot less minerals in it, uh, which is obvious because the crop yields per acre are a lot lower. And uh, this, I think the same minerals that aid in growing crops also aid in growing antlers. Uh, so it also stifles antler growth per same age bracket of deer. You know, you go out to, you go to Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, where they've got good rich soil and high crop yields. They also have large heavy antlers. So I think that has a lot to do with it. The minerals that grow crops also help grow antlers. Um, and that's the main reason I prefer hunting downstate where there's more ag and darker soil and more minerals. Uh, the, November, uh, the November 7th seasonal time frame is right at the end of pre-rut leading into the full-blown peak rut. And this was a location where I was going to go downstate that I only hunted during the rut phases. And it, this would be my first sit in this spot of the year. Here's a little history about the location. On a sales call in February of 1999, so I'm going back a ways, uh, as I often do when talking to anybody, I asked the buyer, I'm a sales rep, so I was at an account, sporting goods account, I asked the buyer if he knew anyone in the area that allowed, might allow me to, to bow hunt. And he paused for a moment and said, you know what, my brother used to gun hunt on a nearby piece of property, um, and the owners, who are both teachers, he said, built a house in the middle of the property and told my brother he couldn't uh, gun hunt there anymore, but if he wanted to bow hunt, that that would be fine. Uh, but he was strictly a gun hunter, so uh, me obviously quit hunting there. I was dressed properly for the sales call, uh, you know, usually dressed casually, and I'm driving a regular minivan, so uh, I was also dressed properly for asking permission from teachers. Uh, so later that afternoon, I went to their house to ask permission. I think, I think that's kind of important to note is when you're asking permission from people, uh, you know, don't assume that they think camo is a fashion statement. You know, dress nice um, if you can. Take your wife, take a child. Um, 
men have a harder time saying no to them. But uh, when you're asking people, especially if you're anywhere near a big city, uh, there's an excellent chance that they're uh, non-hunters. And this was the case with these teachers. So, uh, you know, dress appropriately. Um, you know, don't go there in a camouflage suit like you're hunting. And try not to go there with a vehicle with a bunch of signage all over it, bow hunting signs and antlers and stuff on the windows and stuff. Try try to keep it as low profile as possible. I think that ups your odds because that's a vehicle that's going to be parked in their yard, so they don't want neighbors to see it. And this particular area had quite a few homes around around the section. I was dressed properly, so I, I went over to their house, which wasn't too far from the store, a couple miles maybe. And almost in the same sentence after introducing myself and mentioning what I was there for, I mentioned the gun hunter's name just to break the ice before he was able to just say no. So I, I said that all in one fast sentence, which I'm pretty good at talking fast. Uh, and the property owner said, yeah, I remember him. He was, uh, you know, I let him gun out here and, and I actually taught him in high school. And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, his brother told me that you were his teacher in school. So so we had, we had something of a common conversation point right from the start. So we had a friendly conversation about our families, our jobs, and our hobbies. He was also the high school golf coach. And uh, I was on our high school golf team back in the 60s. So uh, we had something in common there as well. Uh, he had three grown daughters that were out of the house and I had five grown kids that were out of the house. So we had that in common as well. Uh, the only thing we that I steered away from was talking about politics uh, because they were teachers. So I kind of figured there's a real high percentage um, what political party they were from. So I did not go there. Typically when I'm talking to farmers, um, you know, I have no problem talking politics because we're usually on the same page. When I mentioned where I lived, because I told him, he asked me, well, where, whereabouts do you live? And I said, I live up north. And he said, well, why in the world, you know, how far I, I told him how far away I lived. He said, why would you drive over two and a half hours to, to go bow hunting when you live up north and you probably got bow hunting places up there? He said, there's, I know there's a lot of public land all throughout the state. And I said, yeah, and I hunt a lot of that. But I said, the bucks are bigger downstate. And and I said, that's kind of what I'm after. I didn't tell him that I was an author or any of that stuff. You know, we just a regular conversation. And uh, anyway, when I told him about the bigger bucks downstate, he just laughed and he, he didn't get the whole hunting for big buck thing at all. As I mentioned, his three daughters were grown and gone, uh, so there was no worries about kids, you know, playing in the yard while I would be hunting because, again, his house was right in the middle of the section. Maybe it was a little bit up closer to the uh, to the road, so his driveway wasn't so long. It was a little tighter to the north road, but it was pretty close to the center. Um, anyway, he said, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you can bow hunt here. Um, there, he also said, you know, there's three other local guys you know, that live within 10 miles of here that also have permission. And I thought to myself, oh, wow, three other bow hunters on a 40 acre parcel, including my, with me, that's four with a home in the middle that's sitting on probably, you know, three or four acres of yard. Um, that was not a very good scenario, I thought. But um, the property owner did not hunt. Uh, he insisted that the hunters park in the corner of his yard by the shed so he could keep an inventory of when they come and go. And, uh, you know, since, since he knew exactly when they hunted, I, I asked him if the other hunters had any sort of hunting pattern, you know, as far as when they showed up, mornings, evenings, weekends, blah, blah, blah. And, and he said they only hunted mornings and evenings. And I asked him very specifically, so they never hunt during the mid midday? And he said, no, never. I've never seen a vehicle here in the middle of the day. And he said they don't hunt a lot of mornings either because they all they work. Um, so nobody, no cars or no trucks are here. He said, you know, when we leave during the, you know, weekdays to go to work. Uh, he said, but they are here. They come here quite often in the, in the evenings. So I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, you never know until you look. Uh, he thought it was strange that I asked about the other hunters and I explained why. 
I told him that if I could hunt in a different daily, you know, timing or pattern than theirs, it might be worth the long drive. I'll have to look at the property and see. And he wasn't a hunter, so he didn't understand that logic either. There's one very important thing I've learned over the years about hunting mature bucks, and it is no matter the property size and number of hunters, never assume anything until you've done your homework and scouted the property. I learned that lesson in the early 1970s, actually even in the late 1960s, after the only guy that really mentored me, uh, his name was Leroy, he was in his mid-30s, I was a teenager, um, and he, when he started mentoring me, he had a vehicle, so he was my only access to public land out in Pinckney and Gregory area. Uh, he used to use me as a deer deflector. I mean, he would put me in places where deer would literally spook from me, win me, or whatever, uh, and hopefully, you know, transition over past him. Because he was a heavy security cover guy, just like I am now. Um, so there, I had nothing against Leroy once I learned what he was doing to me uh, because I was a kind of a novice. Um, but it was a long-term lesson I will never forget. So uh, many, many times I view other hunters as deer deflectors because if they hunt the same locations and they have a very steady pattern, they're hunting the same locations, you know, multiple, multiple times a year, um, they just alter the deer traffic on the property. So uh, until you look at something, you never know. And before I abandon this, and this is pretty important, before I abandon any size piece of public or free permission property, I have to know several things. And this is kind of my mental list. And I may be missing something, but this is kind of what I, what I look for. I need to know the amount and type of hunting pressure there is. Um, you know, not just the amount of people hunting it, but what's their criteria? You know, how good of hunters are they? Are they targeting mature bucks? Are they shooting does and fawns or whatever? And typically in Michigan, that's the case. They're shooting anything that's legal. Uh, what is the layout of the property concerning the timber? Is there any understory beneath the canopy of the timber? Because on an aerial, you know, you can't tell that. Uh, are there any swamps on the property? Is, what kind of brush is on the property, if there is any? Is it red brush? Is it autumn olive? Uh, is there any briar patches on the property? Is there any waterways flowing through the property or nearby properties? You can't tell that unless it's on an aerial, if it's on a bordering property. Uh, is there any bedding areas on the property? That's very, very important. Um, what type of transition security cover is there from a known bedding area to what may be a feeding area? Because if there's not transition security cover from a bedding to a feeding location, the odds of a mature buck transitioning through there during daylight is pretty close to zero. Uh, is there any isolated master fruit trees that offer the right conditions for a daytime visit? And when I say fruit trees, you know, I'm in Michigan. Michigan has had apple trees all over the state for years, so it's not uncommon to find lost or isolated apple trees out in the woods. Uh, it's not uncommon at all. Not even on, even on public land, because a lot of public lands used to be pastures and and cows would eat apples and drop the seeds all over the place. Um, what are the bordering property layouts and how do their layouts affect deer flow through the property in question that I'm looking at? Uh, will I need a canoe or waders or hip boots? Uh, and when scouting public land, that's almost 90% of the time the case. I usually on public land, um, because everybody has access to the same property, I won't even hunt it unless I have to access places where other hunters won't go by using hip boots or waders or some form of a, a boat or canoe or kayak even. Uh, what do the other hunters' locations look like? Again, that's, that's pretty critical. Are they deer deflectors? Do they know what they're doing? You know, I, on public land, it is so common to find a, a tree stand and if it is in any semblance of security cover, they don't have any shooting lanes. In other words, you get up in the stand and it's like, how would you ever shoot anything here? There's no shooting lanes. You know, they got maybe a 18 inch gap here and there. It's like, you'd never be able to stop a deer in that small of a zone to get a shot. So, you know, what do the other, you know, are they up very high in the tree? Um, 
You know, are they over top of a runway? There's just a lot of things you can read on the skill set of another hunter just by looking at their location. So I like to go through all that criteria before I abandon any any size piece of property. So, you know, again, I was dressed. It was February. I didn't have any scouting material in my vehicle. So after our conversation and I got permission, I pretty much left and went home. And uh, the following week, um, you know, I went down there. But before I did, I pulled up an aerial of the property and the bordering properties. Uh, the north side of the square 40 had a not so well traveled paved road along it between the road and between the road and the mowed yard there seemed to be some low brush with a few scattered trees within it and i noticed that when i was going through the driveway it was all nasty junk going from the road to to the house pulling back into the house on the drive uh, the east and west sides were comprised of mostly what looked to be mature timber because on the aerial it was all you know canopied over and uh, it looked like that same type of timber continued over onto the bordering properties to the east and the west and to the south side of the house was more timber more mature timber uh, with a canopy uh, and it butted up to a large crop field the aerials were also taken in the summer so there was no way of telling what types of trees made up the timber or what type of understory was beneath the timbers canopy uh, but with that type of heavy canopy um, under mature trees you typically there's not a lot of understory there's not a lot of security cover beneath the canopy so it's not very conducive for daytime movements even if there may be a lot of sign there uh, mature bucks just are not going to move through that type of property and be vulnerable during daylight hours in a pressured in a pressured area uh, the entire property and surrounding area were also relatively flat so i overlaid it with a topo and uh, there was very, very minimal undulation. A little bit of a low spot behind the house, but that was about it. The following week, I uh, loaded up all my scouting gear and I uh, drove down in the morning during a weekday when I knew both of the uh, property owners being teachers would be at work because this was during a weekday. Uh, and it doesn't long to scout 40 acres, especially when there's a home in the middle of it. And the first place I looked was obviously the brushy area because I'm a security cover guy. I am not a big timber guy and uh, so that was the first place I looked parked where he asked me to walk back up to the road and just did a grid search through all that brush uh, the property's road frontage again was a quarter mile long and there were short conifers along the road just as I had seen on the aerial I don't think I mentioned that but there was real dark tree trees on the aerial that lined the road on his side of the on his side of the road there was a line of dark trees which i thought were small conifers and that's exactly what they were beyond those conifers it was really dense security cover and it was primarily comprised of autumn olive bushes uh, red brush patches of red brush uh, a lot of briars a lot of briars throughout the whole thing just scattered through everything and tall weeds uh, there were several runways running east to west through the entire transition zone and um, obviously you know and they paralleled the roads and they also there was also quite a few scattered rubs especially on the red brush uh, throughout that entire area i almost couldn't believe what i found next there was a small opening about 50 yards from the road and under three of the autumn olives in the opening there were large scrapes and not 25 yards to the east of the scrape area, uh, there was a big red oak. So this was definitely a primary scrape area. Uh, the brush between the road and the primary scrape area was so dense that even if there were a buck in the scrape area or deer in general in the scrape area, there was no way that a passerby on the road would be able to see them, whether the foliage was on or off. It was just that dense. And also the conifers along the road were also kind of a, a buffer to, from looking into the property. Other than the driveway, the brushy security cover spread the entire width of the property and extended into both bordering properties. Uh, the depth of the brush was only about 90 yards before it met up with the yard. When you really think about that, that's less than a football field. So from the road to the yard where the yard started, 
was less than a football field in depth. Um, but it went all the way, you know, east to west to the bordering properties. So it, even though it wasn't very deep, it was long. So, and it was the, it was without a doubt a transition zone going east to west to other properties. The area was without question the daytime transition zone for deer moving from east to west and vice versa. And guess what? There was absolutely zero signs of any of the other hunters ever being there. It was a surprise. I wouldn't say it was a shock because 90 plus percent of deer hunters, especially bow hunters, gravitate to timber. They like hunting timber. They like having a big visual. And that would not be the case in this spot. This just did not look like, you know, a timber hunting zone, which is what most people like. And uh, and it was also a relatively, because it was so narrow, I, I just don't think anybody ever looked there. There was, you know, there wasn't a lot of trees in there, but there was no sign of anybody ever having a stand in any of the trees. And I found, found no signs of anybody ever having a ground blind in there as well. Because the travel corridor was so narrow, it was likely the reason the other hunters never even considered it for hunting. In fact, after I was nixed of my permission, which will come later in this story, I did end up losing permission here, one of the other hunters told me that he never ever considered scouting between the house and the road, and he'd been hunting there probably for 20 years at that time. Never even thought about it. I then walked through the mature timber to the east side of the house and it was open, too open for my liking. Uh, there was no understory underneath it. It was just what I thought it would be after looking at the aerial. Um, there was one hang on stand in it with a couple runways running by and it was pretty close to the bordering fence line. Uh, so that whole area had one, one stand and it was definitely not a threat. Definitely not a threat because where it was, the odds of a mature buck that I would want to kill um, going through that area during daylight was pretty close to zero. Uh, just too open, too vulnerable. The timber to the south of the house had some decent understory in the form of briars and scattered autumn olives. Uh, and there was a lot of grapevines for some reason. I think it was a little bit lower lying ground. And uh, there was a lot of grapevines in it, and they were pretty much running up all of the all of the trees and choking them out. All of the mid-sized trees, they were just choking those suckers out. Um, and I found two hang-on stands and one double ladder stand in that area, and they were in pretty decent spots. Um, I thought there was a small possibility uh, that one of those stands, you know could potentially have a mature buck go and buy it because there was decent security cover, but possibly deer could bed in there. There was enough security cover for that. As I moved farther to the south, um, I could see, I could actually start to see the open ag field. Because keep in mind, uh, this, is, this is February, so there's no foliage on anything. And when I got close to that field, I was exactly as I expected. Um, that's where most of the stands were at. Um, they were along the field edge, just like you'd see on a TV show. The difference was this section had a lot of homes in it, and I assume many of the small parcels got hunted, so these deer were pressured. Uh, even though there was only four people on this 40, um, I'm certain there was probably 30 to 40 bow hunters hunting within this section, and these deer according to what I could see, did not bet on this property. So these deer were definitely pressured. Uh, that's not uncommon. I hunted a spot in Southern Michigan on opening day for years with a friend of mine. And um, there was always 30 to 40 bow hunters in trees on opening day. So that got beat to death. There was probably 25 homes with small parcels in that section. And this was relatively similar to that. So I, I would assume uh, a lot of hunters in this in this section, uh, so definitely we're hunting pressure deer. Um, so in those types of scenarios, you just don't hunt the same as you'd see somebody on TV. Those guys are hunting in zoo-like conditions where mature bucks would have no issue walking out into any ag field. 
I mean, you see it all the time. Mature bucks will walk out into a pit cornfield, walk out into a short weed field, a hay field, whatever. Um, you know, that's fantasy land hunting. And when you're hunting pressured areas, um, you can't set up like those guys because you're hunting a totally different deer. Um, those guys, those guys are uh, have no competition. Lots of mature bucks where they're hunting because they don't get targeted till they're four or five years old. You know, they they tolerate a lot of human odor. They move a lot during daylight hours. They're susceptible to tactics like rattling and calling and grunts and what and scents and whatever. So, most of you guys listening to this right now do not have that type of hunting. Along the crop field, I saw four hang-on stands, one 16 foot high and one 20 foot high ladder stands. One of the hang-on stands was over 20 feet high and it was in a pretty decent spot because some of that, some of that uh, heavy cover that was right behind the house, you know, just south of the house also, um, there was some security cover leading to this one guy's hang-on that was up there probably 24 feet, I would guess. So, you know, when that crop was in standing corn, I think he would have a pretty decent uh, chance of possibly killing a mature buck because a mature buck could come out of the corn and go behind the house and have that, secu you know, transition security cover from the house, that bedding area, or vice versa, come from behind the house and follow that security cover into the standing corn. So that was a pretty decent spot. The other spots, you know, great spots for seeing deer, which is what most people like. Uh, not very good spots for killing a mature buck. Very good spots probably for just shooting a deer. And there was a lot of deer in this area. So I, I think seeing deer there, it was not going to be a problem. There was also the typical, you know, scrapes, you know, walking along the fence over on the crop field side. You know, there was scrapes under whatever low hanging branches there were. Um, so there was, I don't know, probably half a dozen different scrapes in that quarter mile stretch. And I could s definitely see a mature buck visiting those scrapes if the crop field was in standing corn. But uh, once cut or when the field is in a short crop, uh, the odds of a mature buck visiting one of those scrapes in the daylight is <laughs> pretty close to zero. Uh, but, you know, they would still be active. So a hunter would possibly think they might be worth hunting, but uh, if a mature buck was going to visit them, it would be during the security of darkness if it was a short crop field or a pit corn field. Uh, the matured timber along the west side was open, pretty much just like the east side, uh, with no understory. And as far as I could see onto the bordering properties, it looked or on that bordering piece to the west of his west fence line, it looked the same. Uh, this confirmed that the red oak at the scrape area would be the only location I would prepare. I went back to my minivan, got out my location prep gear, uh, my extension saw, and prepped that red oak. I used Cranford screw-in folding steps going up, and I used Cranford screw-in deluxe steps as my ring of steps for moving around the tree on, because I do hunt out of a saddle and have since 1981. Uh, from the 28-foot high perch I would be hunting from, there was a very minimal amount of shooting lane brush that I would have to clear because I could shoot down into most of the areas uh, wherever there was runways transitioning through. I, I had shots to everything within, within shooting distance of the tree, so I didn't have to clear hardly anything. And the scrape area was about 22 yards away and I could shoot into that. That was totally exposed from the tree. And once I was finished with that prep work, I marked a direct route to the road with a reflective tack so I could easily find the tree in the dark on morning entries. That tree was only 50 yards off the road, so it wasn't that big of a deal. But in the dark, you never want to take one step off your, off your entry route. Otherwise, you kind of get anxious and start to sweat. Uh, since this was a narrow transition corridor and not a bedding area, I could hunt it at any time of the day without concern of spooking deer. My plan would be to only hunt it during the rut phases when bucks are searching for or pursuing estra stoves and using, using the, uh, utilizing the best transition security cover routes when doing so if they're doing that during daylight hours. All that happened in 1999 when I acquired the permission, scouted the property, prepared the location. So let's move forward to November 7th, 2006. 
On the morning of November 7th, uh, I was perched in my saddle and I was up there about an hour and a half prior to first light. And shortly after dawn, I caught sight of a doe running into a tall weave field that I was next to, CRP field. Uh, and she had a young six point closely behind her in pursuit. Even though the doe wanted nothing to do with him, he kept, he kept up the chase. Uh, he didn't seem to care that she was unwilling to stop. He was just being a subordinate buck and doing what subordinate bucks do. Uh, they chase every doe that wanders within sight. You know, it just blows my mind sometimes. And earlier, mid-October, somebody will see a, you know, a six-point or four-point, a year, basically a year and a half old buck chasing a doe. And, oh, my God, all of a sudden on Facebook, oh, the rut's on. I just saw a buck chasing a doe. And uh, that's not the case. They're subordinate bucks. They're trying to learn the process. And uh, their testosterone's rising a little bit. And they're just chasing any doe that they see for the most part. So several minutes later, another doe came into the field and the little six pointer, he gave up the first doe and took off after her. Within several minutes, they all moved back into the timber and that was done. While I rarely waver on a plan, on a hunting plan, I'm always contemplating all my options while I'm sitting there. You know, what can I do to up my odds to capitalize on killing a good buck? I'm, you're always thinking that. So every rut phase location runs through my mind. Where should I hunt next? What tactics might I use? What might I have done wrong so far this season? The thoughts are just never ending. Um, I already had a plan for the rest of the day, uh, but by eight o'clock, I was getting antsy, questioning my plan of staying till nine, and I decided to get down. So I got down, voted, and headed downstate. About halfway through the trip downstate, it began to drizzle. And I absolutely love hunting in light rain or drizzle, as I think mature bucks in pressured areas move more during daylight hours during inclement weather because they can move quietly. When moving on dry, crunchy leaves, and I've seen this many, many times, a mature buck will frequently stop after he makes a noise on the leaves, and he'll wait and look around for a reaction before taking another stop. When the leaves are wet and quiet, they move at a much quicker pace, which makes them vulnerable for longer distances during daylight hours. I arrived at the property shortly after noon, and there was still a light drizzle, and the temperature was 38 degrees. Absolutely perfect weather. From the road to my tree, I drug a tarsal. And this was a tarsal that I'd cut off a mature buck the previous year and shrank wrapped it and froze. Um, and I've done this before in the past successfully. Um, so I said, what the heck, I'll try it again. So when I got 15 yards from the tree, from the road, which, you know, what is it, 50 yards to the tree, 15, so I only went in 35 yards with my drag, I lifted up the tarsal, and then I walked past the red oak, and I went all the way to the edge of the yard. And keep in mind, this was a weekday, so nobody was there. Um, once I got to the edge of the yard, I dropped the tarsal back on the ground and I went back towards the tree. Uh, I figured if there was a dominant buck sent checking and passed anywhere within this narrow transition zone of security cover that he would cut and follow the scent drag of the intruder buck to where I eventually hung, hung this uh, tarsal. And I hung it about 15 yards away from uh, my tree and it was actually down one of my shooting lanes and I hung it on an autumn olive bush. And keep in mind, this would be the odor of a mature buck that if another buck smelled it, it was an odor he would not be familiar with because it would be a different deer from that was not from that area. And also, I, it must be stated that I was wearing a properly cared for scent lock jacket, pants, gloves, a clean pair of rubber boots, so I wasn't concerned about brushing against all the vegetation that I was rubbing against. By the time I ascended to my perch, which was again 20, 28 feet up to my feet, um, attached the lead strap, put on a Washington scent free detergent Rivers West jacket over my scent lock jacket, and got comfortably situated in my hybrid saddle, it was pushing 115. Uh, now all I had to do was pull up pull up my bow, 
take off and hang my quiver, knock an arrow, put on my scent lock head cover with drop down face mask and put on my calf hide fingers tab and arm guard. At that time I was still shooting fingers. And before I had my tab and arm guard on, I noticed a nice buck moving directly towards me with his nose to the ground from the road following that scent drag that I had laid. Now keep in mind, I was putting stuff on and doing things so I wasn't paying attention all of a sudden. I just heard, I heard something and looked up and he was, he was relatively close. Um, I don't know which direction the wind was from because I don't pay attention to the wind anymore. I haven't since 1997. Um, but there was a slight breeze, but I couldn't tell you what direction it was from. Uh, the buck was moving relatively fast. He must have been coming right along the road just behind those conifers would be my guess. Um, but he was moving relatively fast as they often do during midday, midday, especially along wet ground. And as he approached, I hurried the process of putting on my arm guard and sliding my middle finger through my calf eyed tab. I was very re barely ready before he was within shooting range. The buck was following my tarsal perfectly. He looked like, uh, reminded me back in the days when I rabbit hunted a lot, you know, it looked like a beagle following a rabbit trail. And because the route led to my tree, I had to make a turn, you know, like I mentioned, I made a turn and put, put that uh, tarsal uh, about 15 yards away, where now this buck, if he's following this tarsal, which it looks like he's following it to a T, he's going to stop and he's going to have to make a turn and, and actually make a 90 degree turn to go follow this tarsal. Uh, when he hit the turn off spot, he stopped and sniffed the area, uh, trying to locate the direction the intruder came from, and it took it took about five seconds before he figured it out and moved down the down that shooting lane you know, towards where I had that tarsal hanging. As he moved down the lane, I came to full draw, and when he turned broadside and lifted his head to smell the overhanging tarsal, I released my Carbon Express arrow from my Matthews Conquest 58-pound bow. The 12-yard shot was true, and I watched as he ran full throttle for about 50 yards, stopped, flipped his tail a few times, got all wobbly legged, which is an awesome sight to see, and he tipped over. Everything happened so fast that I had no clue how many points he had. I just knew that he had a good frame. Uh, and after packing my gear into my backpack, I descended the tree and went over to look. He was a beautiful 10 point. And thinking back, had I hunted back at home until nine o'clock as I had originally planned, I would have been too late to take this buck during midday during his searching pattern. Uh, sometimes a change works and sometimes they don't and this time it worked out perfectly. Uh, decision alterations are interesting because a couple years later on a weekday hunt uh, I planned on hunting until 10 a.m. and I was sitting in the tree thinking of all the work I had to do because uh, it was just a busy time of year for me and uh, I got down at 9 30 and while I was untying my bow at the base of the tree, uh, the buck that I was after, because I was actually on a runway, with a, it was a scrape lined runway, so it was a buck route. Um, I heard a twig snap behind me over a little hill, and man, I was hurrying around trying to get my bow untied and knock an arrow, but I didn't have time before I could knock the arrow, the buck the buck briskly went by me at about seven yards and just kept going down into the swamp. So that was a time that when my change in plans did not work. So sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's always a call that you have to make though. The 10 point died about 150 yards from the actual driveway and after admiring him for about 10 seconds, I walked back to my van. It was only 150 and I felt I had plenty of time to get him, load him in my otter sled, slide him up to the near the driveway, hide him behind a bush or something in case somebody drove in during the middle of the day, which I didn't expect, um, and then go get my van and load him in and leave before the owners got home or any of the other sh hunters showed up. This was the eighth season I'd hunted this property and not once had I run into any of the other hunters. I had spoken to the property owner every year, but when I did hunt there, I always parked before any of the hunters showed up 
and I left after they had left. They're, they were typical hunters. Uh, I only saw them a couple times in the morning, but they came in like a half an hour before daybreak where I was in the tree set up for at least an hour before they even pulled in the drive. And on evening hunts, uh, they would always leave before I got down. Because usually on an evening hunt, I wait until it's pitch black before I get down and, and leave. And most of the other hunters have, have left by then. Um, I, I don't think I've ever hunted with any other hunter that gets in a tree any earlier than I do on morning hunts. Well, my plan of not having to worry about anybody coming in didn't work on this on this day. Uh, after pulling my sled up near the driveway behind some brush, I drove went back to my van, drove down and parked it in the driveway. And this driveway was narrow, so there's no way I could pull over to the side where somebody else could get by me. And I was as I was walking towards the sled, one of the other hunters pulled in and he couldn't get around my van. I had no option but to go meet him. And of course, he could tell I had killed something because the back hatch of the van was open and I had some blood on my hands. I told him I shot a decent buck and uh, you know, I walked him over to where the sled was in the brush and he congratulated me on taking such a beautiful buck. He was actually pretty cordial about the whole thing. Uh, come to find out, he had read my first book, Bow Hunting Pressured Whitetails. He knew I had been hunting there since 1999 because the property owner had told him he'd let another guy in there to hunt. Uh, so uh, he helped me load the buck into the van. Uh, he was also the hunter that took a nice buck off the property uh, before I acquired permission. So in the mid-90s, he shot a, a pretty decent buck. And I asked him if any of the other hunters had ever taken any good bucks since, since that, including himself. And he said, no, uh, nobody's taken anything, you know, over a two and a half year old buck, nothing over 90 inches. My ego kind of got the best of me. And I told him about two other bucks that I'd taken off the property and I had not told anybody else. I did not even tell the owners, you know, I drug them out after dark and loaded them in the driveway where they couldn't see me from the house and, and got them out. So uh, on several occasions over the years, I've lost permission because of taking a good buck and then having the property owner see him or me showing a picture of him or whatever. And then of course he tells all of his relatives and friends and I think you know the gig when you're somebody that just walks up cold turkey and asks somebody to hunt permission and they give it to you. Well, and then all of a sudden he's got relatives or friends that want to hunt the property. Guess who's going to be in and guess who's going to be out. That's just, that's simply part of the game when hunting in pressured areas uh, without owning your own property. It just, you know, it, it just happens. I guess that's the cool thing about public land. You can't lose public land. Uh, in the late 80s, I had what I thought was a very good friend. He actually uh, was in a card club with us, with me and my wife. Uh, and he ended up leasing a piece of property that I had free permission to hunt. And he never even would have thought about leasing it until I showed him a picture of a 10 point I took from the property. Well, I never thought a buddy of mine would go out and, you know, lease the property that I had free permission on, but that's exactly what he did. That's one of the beauties of hunting public land. There's no such thing as my spot and encroachment is to be expected, but you can't lose permission on public land. Uh, the next spring, I received a call from the property owner telling me that one of his daughters was getting married to a bow hunter and that uh, he had to cut my permission. When I went down to remove the steps out of the tree, there was a hang on. It was interesting because there was a hang on stand in the tree and he was actually using my steps to access the stand. Uh, now, obviously, this was prior to season. Um, but it looked like that's what he was going to do he, because he didn't have any climbing sticks or any other climbing apparatuses going up, just my steps going up to his stand. So, you know what? After thinking about it for a few minutes, I assumed that the guy that put that stand there was the guy that helped me drag the deer out uh, because uh, he kept permission because he was actually on the teacher's golf team when he was in school. Uh, 
So I decided to leave the steps. I left all the steps in the tree. I was down there on a sales call anyway. I was combining the two. So after all, I had taken three nice bucks off the property. So I thought, why should I be an ass? So anyway, that's the end of that story. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hey, good luck hunting this fall.